think we're early. A little bit early. Maybe. Ashton Lawson. Just a little bit. How David. are you doing? I'm all right, David. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> <laughs> really, really well. well. We're about to start in about five minutes. Um, I just thought, what a great opportunity to say hi, have a little look behind the scenes a bit. And you've got some interesting technology that you might want to share. Somewhat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just what do you a got? Little bit. I mean, you can see on the screen there, beautiful beach. This is up uh, my cow, actually, north side of my cow. And we're flying through the trees, oh. which is not something you'd normally do with your standard drone. And uh, that's sort of what we're talking about today, Whoa. or at least for this little preview. So <laughs> oh, through hey, nice. through the thing. So yeah, you, you can't normally do that with your standard DJ. So, um, so this is, it's new technology. What is it exactly? New, somewhat new, not quite new. It's called FPV uh, okay. drones. Yeah. Uh, FPV stands for first person view. Okay. And the basic premise of that is I wear a pair of goggles, which shows me exactly what the drone is seeing. Okay. And I fly as if I'm inside it, which gives me much awesome. better ability such a cool to, perspective, isn't it? to operate through tight spaces wow. such as this here at Promtep Cape down in the south of, south of the island. So yeah. It's, wow. Um, Getting really sucked into it. It's awesome. It's awesome. Thank yeah. Thank um, you. And, and um, uh, so, I mean, we're, we're going to be talking about real estate in about two or three minutes. And how can real estate uh, operators, how can real estate developers, how can, you know, villa owners, um, how can they use stuff like this? Well, a couple of things. So actually with, with a shot like this, this is just general destination footage. So if, cool. you want, if you want to sell the idea of Phuket or if you were going to do Samui or some other tropical island paradise, then shots like this are really immersive. They're very new. It's, it's more interesting than the standard really up high shots that are just slow like that. So that's, that's one aspect. Yeah. But since we are dealing with too. property today, yeah. the other thing you can do is fly through villas. Okay. And we'll, we'll see a little bit later in, in this little clip that I've prepared. But uh, if you've got- Getting vertigo, by the way. There okay. you go. Okay, that's more like it. There we go. Feedback so on this, the is, this is a friend's uh, villa. I shot photos here a while back. And when I built the drone, the drone is built by me, by the way, uh, I asked him, hey, can I, can I fly through your villa? And he's like, with what? It's like with a drone. You've never heard of anything like this before. Um, interestingly, though, this has already been happening in uh, around the world, basically in okay. the US and the okay. UK, Australia. FPV. First to Thailand. Is uh, that what we're almost. It's yeah. it's very new. Good. I haven't seen hey, a custom build by you. That's really cool. Custom build as well. You, you can That's get behind and flies, but I, I like to build things myself. Bit, bit of extra. You save a bit of cost, yeah. and you get to tailor tailor make the drone for exactly what you want to do because you can make them big. You can make them small. In this case, because I'm flying through a house, uh, I built what's called a cinewhoop, which has protected ducts. So if you bump into things, it's getting a bit technical now. Cinewhoop. Oh, very technical. Cinewhoop, <laughs> exactly. Okay. But I can bump into things. I can bump into people. I can bump right. into you, wow. and it, it won't hurt you. So that's that's the benefit of a drone of this style. You can get through tight spaces. You can get the impossible shot, and you won't risk damaging anything in a, in a big way. Ashton, Ashton Lawson, right? Yes. We're going to be, we're going to be live pretty soon. Um, Strike FPV? Striking FPV. Striking FPV. The name of this passion project. I, I used to fly a lot when I was younger. In school, I did software development and striking software was a thing that I did. Nice. So striking FPV kind of seemed like a logical, you know, progression of, of that name. Yeah. Okay. Well, there you go. There's a little bit of insight there. We're behind the scenes um, with Ashton Lawson. Ashton, it's really awesome. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you very much, David. Excellent. I think we're going to be cracking off in a couple of minutes. Hopefully, um, yeah, uh, everyone's found, found, found that interesting. Thanks a lot. All Cheers. right, Ashton. All right. See you on the Good other side. <laughs>
as the domestic market really discovers its own backyard. So that's really, um, that's really interesting and superb. And some of the speakers today, we've got Stuart Redding from Banyan Tree. Um, we've got Luca Doty from Homer. He's the founder. We're going to be talking to him about a really, really interesting co-living concept shortly. Um, we've got Michael Kenner from DB Ventures. We have uh, Boon yong um, who is from Boat Patana. We've got um, Chert Quant, and he is from uh, uh, Banyan Wahin. We have Bill Barnett, who will be joining us soon. It's myself and Brennan Campbell, who is the CEO uh, and, and co-founder of Fazwaz. We're really looking forward to everyone joining us in just a moment. But before we get started, we've got a few housekeeping points. So everyone's done so many Zooms now. Um, however, just to remind you, um, if you can please put your questions in the Q&A function, at, um, at, and I will get to as many of them as possible. Okay, let's get going. Stuart Redding, please come and join me. Thank you so much. I'll just shuffle over a little bit here. Hi, David. Um, how are you doing? Yeah, good, thanks. Good, thank you so much for joining us. Um, uh, just kind of set up the market, um, if you can, a little bit. So the Thailand real estate resort, real estate market, how is it shaping up at the moment? Well, I think just like the hotel sector, the property sector uh, hasn't been immune to uh, the downturn. Um, and obviously, we've seen probably a slowdown in construction. Some projects have stalled and so forth. But what I do think is Thailand has always proven in the past to be very resilient and recover from uh, you know, uh, uh, um, events, right. as we've seen in my 20 years here. And I'm sure it will recover. And one of the great things is within five hours flying time, of, uh, of Thailand or Phuket, right. we've got 50% of the world's population, which yep. is an emerging middle class. So yep. I think that augurs well That's for fantastic. the future. Um, um, tourism has uh, is, is been, a, has been a, um, you're based in Phuket. Um, yeah. Tourism has been a, a really big play for Phuket for many years. And we're talking about hotel residences here. Is, and you talked about resilience earlier. Is there a particular resilience with hotel residences? How have hotel residences fared? Well, I think when it comes to brands, uh, people, uh, you know, uh, generally trust brands because of consistency right. and, and global reach. Um, so I think the other important thing in, in regards to hotel residence is there's a lot of brands or projects which are under license. Mm -hmm. So you have to look behind the brand itself as the operator right. and also need to look at the developer and look okay. at their uh, right. capabilities to deliver. So I think that's an important fact that people need to bear in mind if they're looking to invest. That is a really important fact. It's not just about the brand, it's actually who's developing a, a behind it. Tell us a little bit about um, uh, transactions. How have transactions gone over the last, should we say 12, 18 months? I know yeah. it's not been the easiest period sure. that we can remember. Well, I think for us, uh, our group, um, our two main businesses are hotels and, and property. Right. We've fared better probably than the hotel sector. Yeah. So our business levels in 2020 were down about 50%. The positive trend I, we've seen this year, in the first half of this year, our business levels have picked up. Okay. And I think with the, uh, the Phuket Sandbox yeah. um, opening up, and uh, I'm sure that hopefully that will be successful, and probably towards the latter part of the year, mm. when we get the, the Russian market and so forth right. coming, I think we'll, we'll see those business levels uh, continue to pick up more. So. Yeah. I mean, I, mean, I think I mean, there's a positive I mean, but, side. Um, very challenging, though, because you've got the Russian market coming in, you've got the international markets coming in, but um, there seems to have been quite a, quite a pivot to the domestic market. But, but, uh, and so have you changed the way you sell real estate? What are the, kind of some of the, um, have you changed and what sure. are some of the learnings? I mean, you must have tried new things and they're not necessarily all works and you try something else. Yeah, well, I guess two key factors that probably come into play. Um, online. So right. obviously with no people here or very limited numbers of people on the ground, everybody's had to pivot to go to an online platform. Right. So whether that's promoting products, um, whether it's even inspections. Right. So we do a lot of inspections online now. And I think the second factor is having overseas sales representation. So one of the things where I think has really sustained us through this period is a couple of years ago, we made a conscious decision to have offsite sales representation in our key source markets, okay. namely China, Russia, yep. and so forth. Yep. And that's really helped us through because Obviously, there's been very limited business on the ground here. So that's, that's really helped us through. And our uh, overseas uh, channel networks now account for probably about 50% of our wow. sales. Wow, yeah. wow. And have you, have you found um, uh, uh, the Thai domestic market rediscovering? I mean, not um, a Thai domestic market into Phuket, for yeah. example, is not a typical market for, for, for Thai buyers. No, it, it's not a typical market. But I think on, on the hotel side, and Laguna Phuket as a destination, uh, we've really pushed the domestic market to uh, you know to gain traction there, and I think we did it until the, the recent sort of uh, 
COVID waves. Right. And I think that's also all, will all go well for us from a transaction side for property buyers as well. So there's a lot of ties um, in Bangkok that have, you know, um, looking to acquire property here. And it's probably in two sort of key segments. It's either the entry level segment, which okay. is more affordable, or it's in the very high end segment, which people are less price sensitive. Okay. Nice, interesting. Um, and how and how do you see things um moving forward? I mean, is this um uh, it's been such a such such an incredible um, uh, period um for business. I mean, how would you, um are you able to predict or think about what could be what kind of trends are emerging um during this period that you are able to respond to? Yeah, well, I think there's a couple of things. I think uh, one would be source markets. Right. So, um, in terms of the source markets, Phuket in particular is very reliant on. Uh, the Russia and Chinese market. And even with ourselves, about two thirds of our business comes from our top five source markets. But there's new emerging markets and uh, one to probably highlight is India. Right. And I think there's great potential for the Indian market. Number one, they're in close proximity to Thailand. Yeah. Uh, number two, they actually have a desire to visit Thailand. It's one of the top destinations that they want right. to come to. And um, number three, there's an emerging middle class there. Right. So there's this, uh, this, this, this wealth effect. Mm -hmm. And I think they'll be looking to invest in, in properties over time in, in Phuket. Great. How about, how about um, uh, um, storylines such as um, uh, just you know, the space? And I know, I know that there's the Laguna Phuket project here. Um, you know, that, that, are there any sort of storylines there which, um, which, which are interesting? Um, uh, you know, outdoors, lifestyle? Sure. Um, I think there's a couple of things. Uh, number one would be, uh, the affordability. Now, uh, Phuket is relatively affordable compared to a lot of other sort of destinations uh, okay. around the world. Number two, I think um, this tagline we see is safe haven, and that right. can encompass a lot of things. So, you know, in a, some of these source markets that we see, like the likes of China and Russia, some of the things at play could be a currency hedge, getting the money out of their, yep. their, their country because they, they fear that their currencies are going to devalue. Uh, number two, political uncertainty in some of those countries as well. I think lifestyle is going to be one of the big emerging um, issues. So whether that covers well-being and wellness, um, uh, uh, education. I mean, there's great international schools here um, uh, and, and uh, recreation opportunities. Right. And also, I think another factor is um, an inflationary hedge. I mean, there's a lot of money supply in the market. There's very mm -hmm. low interest rates, um, unprecedented yeah. around the world. And I think that's we're starting to see signs of this now causing um, in, an inflationary impact. Yeah. So I think a lot of people are looking to move towards hard assets as okay. a protection or a hedge okay. um, against those. Uh, There's the a few factors at play. Yeah, sure. No, that's fascinating. Stuart Redding, Head of Property Development at Banyan Tree. Thank you so much for joining us today. No problem, Stuart. Thank you. It's a pleasure. You. Thank you. Right. Well, that's Stuart Redding. Um, we now move to something a little bit different. We have a, the founder of Homer. Some people may say, what on earth is Homer? I've never heard of Homer before. Um, but you're soon going to find out because we have Luca Dotti. Luca Dotti is the founder and managing director of Homer. Luca, are you online, please? David, can you hear me? Oh, very loud and clear. How are you? I'm good. It's good to see you. See you too. A little bit about Homer. What does it mean exactly? And, um, and has it changed during this period, the meaning of it? Uh, yes, so OMA is a, is a natural co-living. Co so uh, we'll open uh, uh, three co-livings in the next two years in Thailand. The first one is in Phuket Town, just right across the street of Bangkok Hospital. Second one is in Siracha, Chumbubi Province. And the third one is at the entrance of Laguna. And we are actively looking at expanding our footprint in uh, Bangkok and Chiang Mai. So for us, co-living is, uh, is a property that, which is mainly catered to long-term residents, which is affordable, is sustainable, is tech-enabled, and is community-driven, hence co-living. Um, and I, I think, yes, it has evolved, the concept of co-living in the past, uh, in the past uh, especially the past year and a half since COVID. Um, we like to call ourselves co-living 2.0, because we, we are not the classic co-living where people share kitchen and share private spaces. Every apartment, and we range from studio to all the way to three bedroom apartments, are independent with kitchenette and uh, they offer all the privacy that somebody could need. But at the same time, it offers community. So events and programming within the property that will allow people to get together and get to know each other. So like a little neighborhood. The best of both worlds in a way. Yes, exactly. 
you could, you could still have your privacy because that was always I mean that was always going to be the um, the big the big the big concern about the co living concept. Not everyone wants to be together all the time. Um, as uh, as 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 made before, people are a little bit more fearful of that of that sort of experience. Okay, that's great. How about as a as a real estate model? How does it how does co living actually work? Um, I understand in Phuket Town, you've got a project that's going to be opening. I think it's towards the end of the year, which has I mean, it's a project of scale. There's over five hundred rooms. Um, how is that working as a real estate model? So again, this is a little bit different from the classic co-living that we've probably seen in, in, in other cities in, in Asia or in the rest of the world, where it was usually a, a, an asset light model. So you will have like a, a management company that was leasing uh, various properties and it was just like running some sort of like lease arbitrage. In this case, we, uh, we develop it ground up uh, from, uh, from scratch with our uh, fully integrated uh, value chain we own and uh, operate the property. So this really gives us the ability to control every aspect of design and as well as the property management. And we really look forward to create a community even beyond the boundaries of our properties, because I believe that that's the whole point, right? Where you really, from a business, uh, business, model, business perspective, you really reap the whole benefit of creating community within a real estate property. Um, so, it's all about generating uh, very predictable and stable cash flows. So we really look at attracting uh, uh, long-term residents, people that in the case of Phuket Town work at the hospital, work at international schools, uh, but we are also able to accommodate medical tourists with you know, shorter term leases or digital nomads because we have a full-fledged co-working space. So it's really that mix of longer and short term, but always having a base of residents that will you know, create the community that we really need to, you know, achieve the, the whole purpose. Thanks. Um, um, I, love, I, I, love, I love the thinking and I love the innovation behind it. Um, one thing I, I, was, I was looking um, uh, at your website and I've looked, I've looked at the brand and what I found fascinating too is it's quite deeply rooted in sustainability, um, just in, in, in many, many, many different ways. Um, I'd really like to ask you a little bit about that um, from the point of view of, financing and, uh, and real estate development, as that's really the topic for today. Yeah, so we're gonna be the, the very first uh, residential apartment building in Thailand, which is gonna be LEED certified, which is a global organization that recognizes efforts in the sustainability space. We have also been working closely with IFC, the World Bank, and the property will be Edge Advanced certified. But apart from you know, the certifications, which obviously like, you know, they look good, but uh, uh, we really uh, took a, 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 we really look at designing the space in order to be a better place for living. So, and this goes from energy savings uh, um, uh, initiatives from solar panel, uh, energy efficient glazing, um, uh, energy efficient uh, uh, kitchen appliance and air conditioning, but also natural ventilation, air quality monitor. So everything that will make the, 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 the space more healthier and more livable for residents. Um, yeah, thanks. I, I, understand, I understand from a, from a financing point yeah. of view, Luca, um, yeah. you, you were able to um, secure a, 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 please correct me if I'm wrong here, but a $20 million UOB loan. It's kind of a yeah. green loan of, of some sort. We'd really be interested to know more about that. Yes, we are very fortunate to be supported by, by UOB. Um, and the UOB has a sustainability framework that supports, that actually promotes uh, sustainability efforts in the real estate space, but not only the real estate space, in different categories of business. But we were able to secure a green loan, which is basically like a, 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 a loan uh, with the commitment to um, be sustainable in all our practices. So we've been uh, basically pledging to um, uh, reduce carbon footprint and, and adopt all the um, energy um, efficiency solution that I just described. Just kind of a nice to have. It wasn't just something to appeal to customers. It's actually had a, had, had a kind of uh, an important financial bearing on your, uh, on your business and, model. Yeah, too. and if I may add, I mean, we really took the step of like looking at each of these investments that we were making in sustainability and, uh, and calculate the impact on returns that this could have. Even if something mm -hmm. is probably more costly upfront, 
the energy efficiency and the savings on the operating expenses that this is going to produce over the years and the multiple that may have upon exit will be accretive to the return of the project. So everything that we're doing is not only good for you know, residents and for society, but it also has uh, an economic returns, which is very valuable to us. Yeah, love it, Luca. I'm getting a few signals here that we've got one minute left. Um, and I really want to get to an important question because, um, which, which is about basically about your customers and about the audience. Um, um, uh, and, and in many cases, um, the other people on the, on, on the panel, um, they're buyers. Um, they're buyers coming from different uh, domestic buyers. Your customers are also very domestic. Is that correct? Yes. But, but, we, but, we, but in a different but bracket. We, yes. But we don't sell anything. It's a pure rental model. So we're looking for people that will come and rent and live in our apartments. Um, we're targeting uh, from, you know, the, in the more affordable segment, uh, uh, residents with a household income of about 40, 50,000 baht per household. That means one person or even a family. And, uh, and, and we have obviously like more um, uh, premium apartments for people that desire just bigger spaces. Um, so in Phuket town, for instance, uh, people working at the hospital and, and teachers in Siracha, Japanese engineers working in the factories around there. And in Laguna, we believe awesome. that there's going to be a lot of hospitality uh, employees uh, looking at this product. So thanks. Great. Luca Doty, um, founder and managing director of HOMA. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, we're going to be moving on to um, uh, um, disruption. And who better to introduce it to you than Bill Barnett, Bill Barnett, managing director of C9 Hotel Works. Bill? Thanks, David. Oh, sorry. Oh, my God. Oh, wow, it's hot out here. Oh, God, God, it's burning up in the sandbox. What can I say? Today, we're here with Michael Kenner. Michael Kenner is the founder of DBV. Mike, come on in. Sorry, I've got your sunglasses today. Welcome to a disrupting session. Michael Kenner, an amazing guy. He's founded DBV, which is a digital disruption, um, basically point a venture which has done a lot of startups. You've worked with Pazwas, you've worked with uh, Insurance Startup, Tattoo, My Medi Travel, The Tiger as well, and also SciGi, which is another home healthcare startup. So yeah, so you're doing a lot of things, Mike. Yeah, we're building lots of different technology solutions in the Southeast Asia. So uh, yeah, really Okay, but today we're going to talk about real estate. So real estate disruption. I know you were one of the co-founders of Pazwas as well, and Pazwas has a lot of technology. Correct. So. Um, I think that you know the main thing we're looking at is Fastpass has almost a million searches every single month. So we have loads of data in relation to what's going on in the market. That's not just data on what people are searching from, but inventory data and all different indicators piled into the models. The question was, is during this pandemic, how can we utilize this data to make both developers' lives, buyers' lives, renters' lives, and sellers' lives a lot more easier? And we've got lots of different technology solutions that we've developed and are coming out to try and solve these problems. And what's your viewpoint about a bricks and mortar brokerage? You know, is it still relevant? No, it's not. I think um, you know, in, in Western the markets, 95% of searches of real estate start online now. And this is, you know, this is only going to increase to probably maximum capacity. So we think that you know, tech-enabled brokerages that utilize data and technology will be not just a way future forward, but only the, uh, the normality, yes. Yeah. Anyway, DBV, we're also doing a lot of innovation as well. You know, we've talked before about AVM, right? Yeah, tell us a little more about AVM. Okay, cool. Uh, here we go, we got a, a new sound on, there we go. All okay. good? So AVM is automated valuation models. So this exists in more of the West, but what we're doing in Thailand specifically is we're bringing valuation real time directly to any consumer, whether that's a developer or a buyer or a seller. So for example, how do you price property in Thailand? Lots of different developers, sellers, they put a finger up in the air and they price. I'm sure there's slightly more to that. What we do is we use both macroeconomic indicators and micro indicators. Every single transaction that's happened during our platform, every single search and every single price to value property in Thailand. Um, you know, it's so advanced now that three of the biggest banks in Thailand are utilizing this to actually price up mortgages. So the AVM is our automated valuation model and it's now available to everyone for free. Oh, how do I do that? So you go onto the website and I think you find value your property. That's Fazwas. That's Fazwas.com. And you value your property and it will give you a valuation. It will give you a price. And also it will give you an indicator in relation to how accurate we believe this price is. Because in some rural areas, 
we find it hard to price. But in you know CBT areas like Midtown Bangkok or Phuket or, or Pattaya, we do this really well. One of the most interesting things is in the pandemic, property prices are fluctuating. We're saying, how much is my property worth? You know, getting an appraisal in terms of how is the AVM really going to show an accurate? What if my what if the value of my property is actually lower than I think it is? Yeah, and, and this is actually, you know, the majority of the use cases. So it uses basically demand of the platform to adjust prices as well. So we're not just looking at what's happening on a macroeconomic level, for example, exchange rates and inflation. We're also actually using our demand side, buyer side, to actually price property. So if we have heavy demand for a certain property type in a certain region, we'd increase the price, you know, within reason to the actual property itself. So you're able to give real-time valuations versus waiting weeks and weeks for hard valuation. Correct. So if you go on the value of property today and you go on the value of property tomorrow, the price will change. Not very much, probably a few dollars. But every day we run our algos. It actually takes about six hours to actually run a process of the ABM. It's such a large competition power. So it, this takes a long time, but every day we update it. Okay. So if I'm a real estate developer today, I'm saying in the middle of the pandemic, it's been, well, it's been a pretty harsh 16 months going into maybe two years soon. How can I use technology to get better results to start selling properties as well? Yeah, that's a great thing. So I think pricing is important and understanding data. So FASWAS is launching something called an Insights app, which has all the data across our platform given to all consumers now for free in a data dashboard. It's called the Insights app. So I would use technology like this. I would also utilize all the platforms. It's not just FASWAS. There's DD, Dot Property, HipFlap, and many others because they have a good representative of what's going on in the market. They use, all use algorithms to basically display real estate. Move to virtual tours. Virtual tours, you know, things like Matterport, this is a thing of the now. You don't have to view the property. You can literally view it in detail before going there. And there's lots of other utilities you can actually use with the technology. I mean, one, one big question has been for foreign buyers who can't get to Thailand and want to buy a property. How much can you automate that process through, through the digital side? Well, we have processes like make an offer now. So digitally, you can go online, make an offer, offer you know, the buyer or seller 25% below market value and negotiate online without the use of agents. That actually exists to now. I think the, you can do everything digitally from contract creation. The only thing you can't do is transfer, which has to be done at the land office, which can probably be done under power of attorney. Okay. What's exciting you out there? Maybe one final question is, what's exciting you as far as technology next? What's going to be next for PropTech? Well, I think that, you know, the whole move of, say, travel agents online, I think we're seeing this with real estate now. So how far will this go? Will we see the rise of digital real estate agents, whereas just platform-based? You know, this is where we think potentially it could go with the less reliance on people to do, to, to actually, you know, agents to do any work. So we believe that this future and we're hoping that we can get there over the next five years. Michael Kenner, a man of many hats doing a lot of digital ventures out there. Thank you so much for talking to us today. And again, we look forward to new startups coming from you soon. All right. Yep. Hopefully. Okay. Thank thanks, Mike. Thank you. Okay. Our next speaker is going to be Boon Yang Sakul, who's the who's the chairman of Boat Patana. Boon. Good boon. How are you today? Good. Good afternoon, Bill. Okay. Now for those of you who don't know Kun Boon, Kun Boon is one of the most prolific developers here in Phuket. You've had a great track record over the past uh, over the past few years, you've virtually rewritten the map in, here in Phuket when we talk about the Boat Avenue development as well. I think, you know, this project we're looking at, uh, Shambhala, was a luxury villa project. I think you launched it just before COVID-19. But I guess once COVID-19 came in place in the pandemic, what changed from your buyer profile? Well, originally I was thinking, well, I can sell it to the Russian, the Chinese, even the Indian, and of course the European. However, when COVID come, I'm stuck. None of them could come or ever make it. Of course, most I spend uh, the sale on the expat about 20 to 30 percent. But then when the COVID hit, I have to change my market suddenly. But out of that, because the interest of Thai bank is very low. So Thai people who haven't been working for a long time because they spend most of the time outside in Japan, skiing, etc. They come to forget for a holiday and they come back because they couldn't go anywhere else. Then they realize, why not? They do some investment here. They can either stay here, rent it out. And of course, with Thai buyer, the thing is they can get the bank loan. And of course, the bank is willing to loan to people who got a good credit. So at the end, they can leverage their property and still get some profit from the investment. So then it becomes the new trend for Thai people to invest, not just from Bangkok, but also up from North Chiang Mai, let alone they also rent away from the smoke from the past few years. So we surprisingly, we see more and more Thai people are investing in Phuket. 
and particularly in this area because it's the area where they say there's a supermarket restaurant where they are comfortable just like CBD of Bangkok. Right. So I think in terms of, I mean, it's been interesting. So your sales really, when you look back two years ago, your sales pace is still there, the absorption rate of your properties, right? Well, now, surprisingly, the absorption in the year 2020 is slowed down significantly because nobody knows what's going to happen. But towards the end of the year, when people get used to uh, COVID and people start traveling again, people start to gain confidence. And now start of this year, when we start to see the light of the end of the tunnel, people are more comfortable to come back and invest. So and people realize that rather than having their money sitting, nothing, they have to start reinvest again. As a big developer, what's the character of your developments? You know, you know, if you're trying to describe what your character or your philosophy towards development is. I would say our vision is to become the leading uh, development in terms of leisure and investment. Meaning that either you invest for your own investment or you really want to stay in our project, you are most welcome. Or also you invest in the of leisure because living in Phuket or the southern part of Thailand is mainly 99% involved in terms of tourism. Right. So we are quite clear on our vision and our goal. We are considered ourselves more of a boutique developer. Something we've talked about in the past is certainly here in the greater Laguna area, actually Laguna rewrote the map, but you guys are rewriting it as well in terms of an urban process. You know, every, every island changes. We kind of see how resort communities start to urbanize. And here in uh, Chirantale, you know, or greater Chirantale, we're seeing an urbanizing process. Well, certainly Boat Avenue has gone that way, and certainly now with your boot, with your upcoming Boat Park. How do you think that process can change? Are we going to see an urban community here in the north side of Phuket? Certainly. Honestly, I didn't think we would go this far. When I started, I wanted to do just another condominium residential, but then I realized that people need a good coffee. Coffee, so I turned it into a chop house. I needed a good From coffee every day. I got a good supermarket, which has become the anchor tenant. And since then, it became like a skyrocket. We got more shop cafe locally. Then we got some brands from Bangkok. From then, it started to accommodate people up from the north, from the airport, right to people from Patong, where people can really live here with variety of choices. And now we realize that becoming NCBD, where it stands for Northern uh, CBD of Phuket. So we are getting shot of car park. So now we are doing what we call it, Boat Avenue Park and Playground. And the name says just that, park and playground to complement the whole uh, generation from children, uh, parents, adults, or people who have pets. So then the whole area will be more of a lifestyle area where you can choose rather than being in a crowded place, you can live in a quality living. How much is lifestyle changing? I know for Thais, after, after COVID-19, we're seeing you know, people going to parks. We're seeing, well, except for Bangkok right now, you're not going to the park, but elsewhere, we're seeing people with outdoor activities as well. Do you think that's going to impact as a developer, you're going to be changing your product and developing more open spaces, more green spaces? Certainly, I do. In terms of investment, you don't have to invest just in terms of residential. Why don't you can invest in the commercial and retail? which is easy to look after lower maintenance. And of course, it's becoming more liquid when the place is vibrant enough. But of course, you have to have the clear location where you can do that. Okay. One last question. Kun Boon's secret of success for upcoming real estate developers, what's the one thing? First thing off, you have to be hand on. You have to know your common ground and you have to keep get out of your own comfort zone, try something new. You may fail nine times, but the only time you success that's when you feel what you will remember. A lot of learning, sir, Kunbun. Thank you so much. And we're going to be excited to see Boat Park coming up and certainly the CBD coming up as well. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Kunbun. Kunbun. Thank, you. Thank you. I think David Johnson's going to be back with us. David, how are you? Good, thanks, Bill. I, How's things with you? It's really hot. Do you want sunglasses? Is it, no, no, no. Uh, I'll be going after. I'll, I'll, I'll leave those you. to yeah. you. Okay. Um, thanks, Bill. Uh, fascinating stuff from, um, uh, from Kunbun uh, in, in Phuket. Uh, from Boat Patana. Right, um, we're going to move northwards of Phuket or southwards of, um, uh, of Bangkok a little bit. We're going to go to Hua Hin. Um, in Hua Hin, we have a, a fascinating development. Um, Banyan Hua Hin, Banyan Hua Hin um, has residences, it has a, it has a resort, it has, a, it has golf. Um, it's an expansive destination. And, um, and we're delighted to have the CEO um, who is, goes by the nickname of TJ. Um, Chiet Quant um, joining us. Thanks very hey, much David. for joining us. Hey, David. Good afternoon. Excellent. Very good afternoon to you. We've heard a lot today about um, this lifestyle reset. Um, 
What do you have to say about that? I mean, it's different in different places. How is that in Wuhan? Is that affecting the real estate market? Yeah, well, definitely. And I think it's not typically Wuhan. It's a global trend. And, um, and, and several researchers, like, for example, one from Knight Frank, uh, who did a global uh, survey amongst home buyers, uh, show very clearly what's, uh, what's, let's say, the result of the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, over a quarter of, uh, of the buyers that they, that they uh, interviewed, they said that they are going to purchase a second home because of the pandemic that they will use as a kind of a retreat that they can escape to. And especially that counts for people who live in metropoles where it's congested. Uh, and, and especially after a period of confinement, uh, people want space. Uh, most of them, they want to have the test villas where they have space close to nature, close to water, where they have privacy and can live safely from external threats like a pandemic. And this retreat is also a place that they will, that they, they will meet with families. So it should be extended and, and, and suitable for uh, multi, uh, multi-generations. So it, it mainly there's, their homes in, in resort towns uh, will become or have become a place from which they will work, exercise, learn, socialize, relax. And that all is something that also applies to Thailand and definitely also to Hua Hin. Uh, we can see that, we can hear that from our uh, clients, uh, uh, our agents. They also confirm that, let's say, around 80% of the, the properties they sold in the last uh, 12, 14 months are uh, villas that, that least meet these kind of requirements in Hua Hin. And resort destinations like Hua Hin, like Phuket, Pattaya and Samui are perfect places to detox, in fact, from crowded, congested, cramped and polluted uh, metropolis uh, like, like Bangkok. And basically, in short, in, in, sorry, please. Yeah, in short, uh, buyers, but also tenants. It's not only buyers, right? Also, people who rent a home, uh, short term, long term, escape the city. They are looking and seeking a healthy, active lifestyle destination to enhance their physical, mental, and emotional well being. Right. Have you really seen this lifestyle reset um, impact in Thailand? I mean, um, uh, t- 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 Thais never really bought extensively in their own backyard. Um, certainly a lot, a lot of them. I mean, they may have bought some, but not really um, so much luxury real estate. Um, is, are, you, are you really seeing um, that the Thai market adopt this? Yes. And, you know, it's kind of partly forced because of the fact that they simply cannot leave the country or they are afraid of, uh, of flying. Um, and, and they are kind of, well, forced to discover what Thailand has to offer. And we also have that in Hua Hin. It's, a, it's an interesting example. I experienced last Saturday a new, <clears throat> a new buyer of a villa at Banya uh, signed and, and I joined. Uh, so I asked them their background, why they come to Hua Hin. And, uh, and the lady, she said, listen, my husband was raised here and, uh, in, in Bangkok and, and went to Hua Hin uh, when he was younger, but I never liked the place so much. So for me, it was a no-go. But she said, now we were four since last year. And she said, I was so surprised to see what resort towns like a Hua Hin has to offer. And obviously they fell in love because they bought a uh, beautiful villa at the Banyan uh, recently. Are you, are you able to give us some, uh, any, uh, any, any, any data on that? Um, uh, any sort of sales data? I know we're not here to talk about individual projects so much, but I think the audience might be interested in yeah. um, uh, 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 any transactions and um, value of transactions? Well, I can say that this year so far, uh, we sold for more than 125 million baht in sales value, uh, which is uh, much more than uh, 20 and, uh, and even the second half of 19 uh, combined. Um, and especially the, uh, the, the proximity to Bangkok, uh, the destination who are in, but also the fact that we have, as you mentioned already, uh, activities uh, on site with the golf course, also important for many of them, uh, an on site uh, international standard medical center, especially in this period with, with COVID, is that, uh, is that a huge uh, asset? So, yeah, the, uh, that is one thing. But the other hand, we also have 41 rental villas, two bedroom villas. And since uh, June, more than 90% is occupied, and almost all Bangkokians that escaped, who escaped the city. 
Well, has that, has, that, has, that been, has that been kind of playing into this um, uh, the work from home? What do they call it? Um, uh, WHF? H? <laughs> um, <laughs> hey, thank yeah. you. Um, yeah, to, to be of, honest, I, I, prefer, I, mean, I, mean, is, is, I prefer the WFW, ahead, to be honest. WFW, okay. because, you know... That's not a wrestling, um, that's not a wrestling um, uh, an acronym, then. It could have been, but in this, in this case, it, it, it means working from wherever. Because, okay. you know, working from home, home is one of the places where you can work from. But I'm pretty sure that you and Bill and others, uh, including myself, we can work from wherever. As long as there is a decent internet, uh, good coffee, uh, preferably, and, uh, and an inspiring uh, environment where you can work. And that's, in fact, is also key for why it's more easy for people to come to Hua Hin. Because they know that they can work from uh, Hua Hin. And the fact that kind of also COVID caused us to uh, to get used to a new normal in, in working, right? So, and, and once we have done that for a certain period of time, it becomes a new normal. And now it's quite normal to work from home, work from a restaurant, hotel or whatever, but also from a second home in Hua Hin. But, but, but I'm, I'm one, of the, I'm one of the changes being that these, these are not um, kind of the so-called digital nomads. These, are not, yeah, these, these can be busy executives and they're sitting in coffee shops in Hua Hin. Um, Phuket, where have you, um, Patia, um, and they're actually working, running their businesses. Yeah, definitely. And like, um, it, and, and if you have to uh, have a meeting, you can sit wherever and put a nice background that I have here, because I don't think you believe that I'm really on the on this beautiful uh, terrace of one of our villas. I should have wore also a, uh, glasses like that. But you can, you can work from everywhere as long as the environment is yeah. okay. But I think the most important thing is it is a requirement for people when they, when they buy a home uh, at Banyan or wherever in, in Hua Hin or Phuket, whatever resort destination. You can combine the relaxed, healthy atmosphere, environment, nature, ocean, clean air, uh, and still you can work uh, from home or wherever. And, and that is uh, definitely one of the key requirements from our homeowners. Last quick question, please. Just regarding, um, you know, um, uh, if there is, um, we're going to see some data in a minute. And, uh, and some of the data is going to reveal, you know, Hua Hin being, being, being a really hot destination. And, uh, and I suppose the question is, I mean, just 10 years ago, Hua Hin was just, you know, it was a sleepy fishing village. I mean, you know, is it going to be able to cope with this? Is it, uh, does it have the infrastructure? Is it going to be something that the streets are going to be clogged with traffic? Does it have an airport that can, that can expand? I mean, just, just, just some, uh, a few quick comments on that would be useful. Thanks. Yeah, well, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a key question. And there is also the perception from the past that Hua Hin is very difficult to reach. It will take a long time, four hours, five hours to get there. And in the past, in the, in the busy uh, days, the weekends, it was definitely the case. But I think most of the people they know, and living in Bangkok, they know that the, uh, the highway is, uh, is, is being widened at the moment and it uh, should be finished in the next uh, year and a half, which helps a lot. Um, there is being an, an elevated highway out of Bangkok under construct construction there is a double track railway uh on the construction which should be ready within a year and a half and they extended the runway on the Hua Hin airport there is already a flight uh, between the Hua Hin and uh and Malaysia uh Kuala Lumpur mm. but they're also working on uh, direct connections to Hong Kong Singapore and other destinations in uh, Asia and there is uh, a four-lane new highway ring road around Hua Hin. So yes, definitely Hua Hin has been prepared to cope with this kind of uh, number of visitors. Great stuff. Great stuff. Um, Jed Kwan, uh, CEO of Banyan Hua Hin, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing yeah, your insights. Thank you for the opportunity. Excellent. Um, right, next up we have Fazwaz. We've left the data to last this time. Um, and um, we have uh, Brennan Campbell. Brennan Brennan Campbell is in the hot seat, and he is the uh, uh, the, the CEO and, and co-founder of Fazwas. Brennan, what do you have for us? Hey, David, how are you doing? Um, I've got uh, a presentation. I think I'm the only one that's got a presentation. Um, so excellent. So today, uh, I'm going to look to kind of share some key trends that we're seeing across the, the the four main resort markets, and hopefully tie together uh, a lot of the conversations that we had today with with some data. Okay. Excellent. Would you like to share your screen? I know you're going to be going through them, uh, uh, the key markets. Yeah. Hopefully everybody can see this all right. So yeah, um, jumping into things right away. So I, I think that it's been hinted at in some of these other conversations, but what I'm going to look at is the key trends that we're seeing across all the markets uh, here in Thailand. And 
I'll dive into each market, uh, the four resort markets in particular, um, and we'll take a look at who's driving demand in each market, how their motivation has changed, um, and what types of properties that, uh, that, that, that they're purchasing. So I think we can all agree that consumer behavior has very much changed uh, since the pandemic, and uh, we'll identify some key trends across these markets. But before we dive into the data for each market, let's take a look at an overview on how demand has changed across Thailand. Uh, TJ just nailed this perfectly, uh, talking about Hua Hin. So when we compare uh, pre-COVID uh, 2019 to today, we can see that one of the first key trends is that the growth in popularity in Hua Hin. Uh, and you can see when comparing this to um, you know, pre-COVID market conditions, that it has seen the, the, the greatest jump in interest and popularity at uh, about 5%, where some of the other markets, you look at the other uh, four main holiday markets we're talking about today, Pattaya uh, has dipped slightly, Koh Samui has dipped slightly, um, and interest in Phuket has definitely softened. Uh, we'll dive into the Hua Hin uh, uh, interest uh, in, in my slide in a minute, but as TJ mentioned, the proximity to Bangkok um, and uh, the overall value of real estate in that market and the different types of properties that are available from, you know, one bedroom or studio, one million baht condos, all the way up to some of the be beautiful Banyan villas. There's a good selection of property uh, that makes Hua Hin a very popular destination. Um, looking, at, looking at how uh, Phuket interest has softened, this leads us to our slide uh, and talking about really historically that Phuket has been a market that's been driven by international uh, investors. Um, and it's been a market where there's been always solid interest in a mix of uh, condominiums and landed properties, houses or villas. Uh, and you can see that that's very much still reflected in the sold unit types by data. So you can see that there's a good mix of studios and one bedrooms. You know, um, we've been very successful at selling properties at Laguna um, this year as well. And then there's a mix of larger two and three bedroom properties. When we look at how that's driving the units by pricing range in this category, it is a reflection of the mass market in, uh, in Thailand is that mass market is between uh, under 5 million baht. We can see that that's uh, driving majority of the transactions here in Phuket. Uh, and likewise, there is a growing segment of the market that we'll see across other markets as well. That is the five to million baht segment is growing in interest. And that's largely because of um, the, the key trend number two here is buyer's motivation. And we spoke about this, that because of the pandemic, you can see that interest is very much shifting from investment driven to holiday home driven, second home properties, so that people can escape uh, and get away um, and, and find a little bit more space. That's just not reflective uh, in Hua Hin or Phuket. We'll see that this is one of the key trends across all of the markets that we're seeing. This trend continues in Samui, uh, as I mentioned, which has largely been uh, a villa market. Uh, and that's reflected in the sold unit types that we can see here. It's not a very densely populated condominium market. So you can see the majority of the transactions are uh, two, three, four bedrooms, which is an indication of landed property selling. And that again reflected in the unit price range that when we look at Samui, the transaction volume uh, is more spread out um, and more tapped into the, the luxury market there because of the larger bedroom configurations. An interesting point, uh, which leads us to kind of one of our uh, key trend uh, number three, is that Samui is a less popular market for the domestic market. Um, and in fact, it's the least popular uh, market when we look at these markets that we're considering today, which is key trend number three, is that there is definitely, it's a, it's a domestic led buying power and that it's the domestic buyers that are transacting, as we spoke about, because they're limited. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're all locked in Thailand. Uh, in the past, you probably travel, um, uh, the domestic market would travel and invest overseas. UK was very popular, but now that drive in holiday homes 
and that drive from the domestic market, we can see that the domestic market is uh, a very powerful market, particularly in Pattaya, which we see here, and the next market, which is which is Huahin. So that buying power um, has has translated for a Pattaya market, which is largely a condominium market, which we can see again in the different types of units that are selling. Um, but likewise, similar to Phuket, that there is a growing segment of the market in affordable landed properties between the five to 12 million uh, price point. Um, but again, in Pattaya, smaller units, the mass market here is under 5 million baht. Last but not least is kind of the, the star of the pandemic. Uh, and um, really this, this market ties all of the trends together that you can, you can really see that motivation here for a second home as it's a hockey stick. It's uh, it's it's trending upwards. Uh, Hua Hin was never a, a huge market for pure investment, but we can see that uh, as a destination to get away from you know pollution, crowded cities, uh, that Hua Hin is 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 a great market. So uh, the unit sold is a mix of condos and villas, and again, I think that is a reflection that there is different property types for everybody. There's smaller condominiums that are much more affordable uh, for around a million, two million baht. Um, there's oceanfront condominiums with beautiful sea views. And then there's this segment of the market, which is affordable landed property, um, which is two, three, and four bedrooms, which you can see in the, in the, uh, in the middle segment here. So overall, um, we see that uh, looking forward, we see that this, these trends still continue. Uh, and uh, we're looking optimistically, though, uh, because with the sandbox model, just in the past few weeks, we've been able to transact properties in Phuket, in Bangkok, in Koh Samui, with uh, international buyers who've actually been through the two weeks in Phuket and have been able to travel out into other markets to purchase property. So we're optimistic about the future, but it is largely domestic-led uh, buying power that is the foreseeable future. Excellent. Brennan, thank you so much for that. Um, just remind everyone that, um, that this data is going to be sent. There's going to be a recording of this session, and, the, and all the data will be sent um, uh, as a part of that recording to everyone who's registered um, when we're done. Right, we've got a couple of questions coming up. I'm going to invite um, uh, um, uh, Mike um, and Kunbun um, into the studio. We're live here in the studio, and we've got a couple of questions here, um, and we've got a couple of questions to... Um, uh, to our panelists. Um, uh, so, Luca and TJ, please stick around. We've got a couple for you. I'm going to start with you, Kunbun. Um, yes, there's, been, there's been a lot of talk about, uh, about Cheung Tele. Um, your vision for Cheung Tele, what are really the, kind of the, the demand drives, I suppose you'd put it, for Cheung Tele? Yes, my vision is that apart from us as a landlord, we see there are many condominium residential from middle end to high end or ultra high end. As a result, I'd like to encourage people or investors to come Right now, we are talking to a few international schools, which may start from kindergarten up to high school, which will attract more people from Bangkok, also from abroad, to be able to really live here. And also besides, we also uh, find opportunity to talk to a maybe small hospital or even a decent clinic. Once you got some decent clinic and international school, then you don't really need to leave the area, basically the island, let alone it's only 15 minutes from here to the airport. So why not become a part of this area and make it a new NCBD as our vision? I mean, it's not just me, but the whole Cheung Tele area. Wow. It's really the, the urbanization of Cheung Tele in, 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 central, in central Phuket um, near, near Laguna. Mike, um, thank you very much for that. Mike, quick question for you. We've got a question regarding transactions. Um, if you may, um, so, so online transactions, how is it going to happen? How are you going to negotiate? How are you going to make an offer? Um, how, how does that work? Yeah, so a lot of people in um, anywhere are not that comfortable negotiating or don't want to use agents to negotiate. So now we understand that issue. So you can now go on and the process is digital. So if you like a property, you can go onto platforms like FASWAS and you can make a digital offer. What that means is you can look at the actual price. We know a lot of inventory is overpriced in the market and make an offer to the seller without the agent and it's automatic. So you can actually say, well, there's a property for 10 million. You can go in and make an offer for eight. The seller will pick this up and he can actually negotiate and say, actually, we're thinking about nine 
and then digitally you can come between say 8.5 and you look in the price before even viewing the property. So you get through the whole taboo of negotiation because some people do not like to negotiate face to face, they find it more difficult, so this kind of bridges that kind of gap using technology. Mm. And do you think the time, the time market would be more comfortable with that? We, we, we think so. We yeah. think like losing face in relation to negotiation, we'll see the actual number of offers go up exponentially as the, we roll out the platform. So okay. it starts off very small, but now we're seeing more and more offers as opposed to inquiries in general. Fascinating. Um, okay, Luca Doty. Look, are you still with us? Unmute, please. Yes, I am. I, c I am. <laughs> I can't stop okay, my video. Okay, great. Though. I can't uh, stop my video though. Uh, don't worry, we can, we, can, we can hear you loud and clear, no problem at all. Um, uh, there was a lot of comments about, about co-living and, uh, and people were inspired by the concept. Um, but there were also some questions about um, you know, why did you go for co-living? And not a condo. Condo is so much simpler, so much sim simpler to, 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 to manage and, and so much, um, you know, and, and, and to build, there's not so many components. What was the thinking behind that? Well, I, I think the, the problem of, or in our opinion, the problem of condominium is, uh, uh, is the tenant experience. You can't really drive the right tenant experience and you always need to you know, go through an agent that will contact an owner and it's never really a pleasant experience to rent an apartment. And once you're in it, you're just renting four walls. There is no programming, there's no community. And uh, so it really comes from the idea that we can get more than just like a roof over our, over our head from a real estate property. And so that's why we, we look into this new business model, which is not really that new in the sense that like multifamily is the biggest real estate asset class in the US, extremely popular in Germany and Japan, but simply in Asia hasn't really developed that much because there's still, I think, a, a short-term mentality. And this requires a long-term investment and commitment to, to the property, not only in the development, but also in the property management. And we have, and there's, and there's one other question. Um, why did you choose Thailand? Why didn't you choose Malaysia or, or Indonesia or, or, or the Philippines or India? Why did you choose Thailand in particular? Is that where you saw the opportunity? Yes, we saw the opportunities and uh, we have been in Thailand since 2008. So we know the country very well. And uh, we had you know, a full team on the ground and um, we, we just love the country, the culture. And, uh, and we believe that this particular concept of community living is really adaptable to Thailand more than other Southeast Asian markets. Okay, excellent. Um, thank you, Luca. We're going to move to Hua Hin. Um, and there's a, there's a question for you, TJ, um, regarding, um, uh, regarding Greater Hua Hin. I know there was talk some years, about, about, you know, years ago about Greater um, uh, Phuket and as, as sort of going north into, into Panga. What about Greater Hua Hin? What do you see in terms of the potential? I know north, you have Pepperi, south, um, going through, um, uh, what is it called, uh, Prachup Kirikan. You have, um, you have some incredible destinations too. You've got Pramburi, um, Kuiburi, where there's, I know there's a, there's, there's a, there's a massive um, uh, uh, reservation, um, natural um, uh, uh, place. Um, what do you think about it? What is the potential? Is this a draw? Um, well, there is, uh, from, from many years ago, uh, there is this uh, project called the Thailand Riviera. Uh, probably you heard about that. And uh, uh, creating a a stretch along the coast with uh, with a lot of new developments that that should match or let's say uh, similar to the uh, French and the Italian Riviera, with a lot of uh, high quality high uh, quality developments, uh, a lot of sports including golf courses and such, and they already started uh, quite a lot of these part of the developments, like also a port uh, more south. Um, so this, this, this area, the greater Hua Hin area, will, is already uh, a destination, like I mentioned, is this, this couple that just uh, moved into their new villa. You know, Hua Hin has so much to offer, but what makes Thailand, in fact, into a popular tourist destination. Uh, many people don't know that. But yeah, there is a lot of potential, uh, especially also a lot, of, uh, a lot of to discover for the people uh, from Bangkok, uh, maybe. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Um, there's obviously a lot, a lot to do there. Um, I'm going to invite um, uh, uh, Bill Barnett. Um, Bill, would you like to come in and, and, and Thanks, say David. a few wait, words? Wait, wait, do, you want, wait, do, you want to, do you want to wrap things up? Are you guys still out there? Is anybody okay. here? Okay, that's not many things. 
No, wait, wait. Guys, come back. 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 We're not going to get away. Mike, come on. Okay. So I've got a question for you guys because we're going to close up our real estate event. A real estate question for the group here. If you didn't live w in the town you lived in now in Thailand, where would you own real estate? David. Where would I own real estate? This, this was not practiced. <laughs> yeah. Phuket. No. Phuket. Oh, there you go. David's from Bangkok, Bangkok, right? Bangkok. Oh, exactly. Good boon. Well, I was already born in Bangkok, but after I live here, and honestly, I cannot think of anywhere else. I still have to choose Phuket. Oh, there you go. Mike? Probably Hua Okay, yeah. there we go. Yeah, I like it there. When okay. time visit, I really enjoy it. And for me, I've got a great sunset here in Koh Samui. This is the Kimpton Hotel in the background there as well. This has been a great show, and when we're looking about Thailand property, what we're thinking is, are people going to be flocking out of the urban centers and coming to the resort destinations? Single family homes are hot. What's going to happen in the property market? And with the sandbox, is that impact going to stir up foreign led real estate as well? So lots of issues. Great guest today, David. Excellent. Okay. Really, really great. Um, thank you so much, Kamboom, for welcome. joining us. Mike, it's thank a pleasure you. to see you um, with, your, with your disruptive insights. Um, uh, There's a <laughs> no, that's right. There weren't any explosions. Um, um, Luca Doty, thank you so much for um, uh, spending the time. Um, from Homer, um, uh, Chiet uh, Quant, who's the CEO of uh, Banyan Huihin, thank you so much also. And Stuart Redding. Stuart Redding's in the pool already. I think I'm going after the sandbox as well, so I'll leave you to it there. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>